I met Lauren, oh, geez, Lauren, how long has it been now? Uh, 2017, 2016? Uh, it, was, it was probably January, 2017. January, 2017. And I remember seeing Lauren at one of our uh, outreach events and I just thought, you know, uh, I'm really impressed with what this young woman has, has been doing. Um, and, and she kind of uh, took the reins on some of the things that we were doing from an outreach perspective and, and was a fixture at many of our outreach events for a number of years before uh, COVID put a stop to some of those. But uh, Lauren, in her short time with the club, has made a tremendous impact and is really starting to grow in her skills as a, an astronomer uh, beyond even just the Houston Astronomical Society. She's becoming very active in other organizations as well, and that's something we're excited to see. Um, but she is an HAS member with a passion for education and outreach. Uh, as a young teenager, she fell in love with spectroscopy after reading A Grand and Bold Thing. I haven't read that book yet, so uh, I, I need to read that. To young to have access to any of the standard equipment, she believed that recording spectra of her very own was a distant, expensive, and exclusive dream until she discovered a method for recording spectra with her 8-inch Dobsonian right here in Houston. So you didn't have to travel out to the dark skies of West Texas to do this, which is, is wonderful. Uh, when she's not working to perfect her drift scanning method, Lauren creates and shares educational materials to help other wannabe spectrographers available and free of charge on her website, tiedieastronomer.com, excuse me. Uh, Lauren is an AAVSO ambassador. That's the uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers. Did I get that right? Yep. And uh, works for the AAVSO as webinar coordinator. So without further ado, I'd like to pass everything over to Lauren for her talk tonight. Lauren, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Joe. Let me go ahead and get my uh, screen share started here. Okay, let me stop here. All right. All right, so real quick, I wanna start with a definition for those of you who have not encountered it before. Spectrography or spectroscopy, the terms are interchangeable as Joe mentioned, um, is the study of rainbows at the heart of it, study of color, the study of how light varies with wavelength, but all of those are ways that you could put it. Um, it's a simple concept, but as with many things, the devil is in the details. Like these details. These are all spectra of different stars that I've recorded using my telescope from my backyard. And each of these little lines that you see here is being produced by a different element or molecule. These spectral details are essentially what uh, astronomical spectroscopy is all about. Um, they call these patterns of bright and dark lines and uh, in different stars spectral fingerprints sometimes. And each star has a slightly different spectral fingerprint. In this, this pattern, the spectral fingerprint is encoded a lot of different information on things that we wouldn't be able to find out about otherwise if, if spectra weren't so awesome for us. Uh, we'd have to fly to a star to take a measurement of its temperature with a thermometer only because we have spectra, we don't have to. Looking at these spectra right here, I can tell you this star right here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, this one right here, second from the top, that's a cold star. And I know that because it's got these wide molecular bands. Molecules only form when it's cold enough that they're not torn apart, right? And molecules form wide stair-stepping bands instead of narrow lines. So I can just look at that, look at that rainbow coming from that star and say, that's a cold star. On the other hand, this one down here, it's got a lot of blue light. It has heated up past the red hot stage through white hot and it is now blue hot. That's how hot it is. You can tell that looking at the spectrum. So that's one piece of information that we can find out through spectrum. Um, you can find out about the pressure at the surface of the star by how much the lines are broadened, like this one right here. It's not a low resolution spectrum. This is a high resolution spectrum, but the lines look blurry. They're being broadened by the pressure at the star's surface. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can find out about when you take a spectrum of a star. It's actually how we know most of what we know about the universe is through looking at spectra. And I first learned about spectrography, as Joe mentioned, when I read the book, a grand and bold thing. And I found out about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And I immediately became an SDSS fangirl. There's no better word for it. Uh, because it was just the coolest thing that I had ever heard about. 
they built this telescope in the mountains to the east of Alamogordo in New Mexico, two and a half meter aperture, already pretty freaking awesome. But what made it so special was that instead of what was standard for big telescopes at the time, shooting a spectrum of one target at a time, one star at a time, they built it so that they could shoot the spectra of 640 different stars at the same time. And, and as a matter of fact, they did that by putting these big plates, like this one behind me at the focal plane of the telescope, which is ridiculous that the focal plane of any telescope can be that big, in my opinion. Each one of those holes there was drilled to match the location of a star on the sky. They plug in a little fiber optic and pipe the light into a spectrograph and record 650 little spectra, rinse and repeat all night long, do that for years, and they ultimately produce tens, maybe hundreds of millions of spectra. They're still going today. Here are a few examples of the kind of spectra that are turned out by the SCSS. Lauren, if I can interrupt you for just a second, I apologize for that. The gray boxes are up at the top. Interesting. Okay, uh, allow me to restart the screen share and let's see if that fixes it again. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, absolutely. And for everybody else, while we're bringing uh, the, the presentation back up, if you have questions, and I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions as we go through here, and that looks good, Lauren, um, feel free to use the chat feature within Zoom to ask those questions. We'll queue those up, and when we get to the end of the presentation, uh, we'll let you come off mute and ask them in the order that we receive the questions in chat. Sorry about that, Lauren. You know what? Um, while we're on the topic of Zoom technical difficulties, allow me to mention, <laughs> uh, I have learned through my job as a VSO Zoom webinar coordinator that sometimes the bottom of a slide will get cut off by your Zoom window if you don't have it full screen. So just FYI, if I'm ever talking about something and you're like, where is that on the slide? You might try full screening it and maybe maybe the bottom of the slide's being cut off. That's usually where the graph, you know, X axis is. So anyway, these are some of the spectra from the SCSS. And when I was when I was 13 and I found out about the SCSS, I would spend hours just searching through their database. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that if I clicked in the right spots, I could get these cool graphs to come up. And I knew that these graphs represented spectra. And I didn't understand at the time really what they were saying, but I knew that I wanted to. I figured that it would probably take me until I had gotten like a degree in astrophysics and gone to work at the SCSS myself before I could start taking spectra like this. Fortunately, I was wrong. And I found out I was wrong thanks to this. SMSW2 was an event I went to uh, about two years ago now. And it was absolutely life-changing. It was a congregation of about 80 different spectrographers, amateur spectrographers, not professional astronomers, amateur astronomers, like me, I'm an amateur astronomer who all turned up in New Mexico and we're sharing knowledge with each other about how to shoot spectra yourself. And I was just like, you can, you can do that? And I learned so much, so much more in those three days than I would have in the next five years otherwise. I'm quite sure of that. Um, unfortunately, by the end of it, I was still feeling somehow, I managed to still feel like, I'm not gonna be able to do this, am I? I felt discouraged. And that's because it seemed like everyone around me had a rig that looked like this. <laughs> and all I had going for me was this. Just a little bit of a difference. Everyone, at, who presented at the workshop was basing their presentation around this kind of rig like on the left. There's a big fancy spectrograph that costs too much, don't even ask. You've got cool science cameras, you've got guiding cameras, you, they had automatic focusers and rotators, and of course, a big beefy mount to carry it all. It seemed like that was one universal, was a big beefy tracking mount, which is most decidedly something that I do not know. <laughs> but, Fortunately, there were a few people who outside of the presentations took the time to stop me in the hallways and encourage me to use my star analyzer to try and take spectra myself. Now, star analyzer is a little device. You can see it over here on the right. 
uh, in my makeshift adapter. Um, it's just a filter cell, like you would have a planetary filter in, that they've put a little diffraction grating in it. And it functions just like a prism when you shine, when you shine light through it. You know how when you shine light through a prism, it breaks up into a spectrum, a rainbow, right? Diffraction grating does the same thing. Um, and so you can take the spectra of stars using this diffraction grating, but typically star analyzers are used to take spectra that are very low resolution, uh, maybe kind of potato shaped, to put it kind of. <laughs> so I went home and I, I said, well, you know, maybe I can't do the fancy science that they were presenting at the workshop, but at least I can take some of these potato shaped spectra <laughs> That people have been encouraging me, I can do it with my DSLR. They find out I have a DSLR and they say, oh, you can do it with your DSLR. Maybe I can just take some spectra with that and, and learn a little while doing it. So, I, oh, once again, I forget that that slide is in there. This is not the first time I've, I've done that. Okay, I apologize. Um, that, was, that was the rule that I learned, the unspoken rule while at the workshop, because if you know me, you know that I have a few different Dobbs, uh, Dobbsonian telescopes, but tracking. They said at the workshop, tracking was a be all end all and my Dobbs don't have that. But with a little DSLR, you can stick it on, you know, one of those small camera trackers, right? And so that was accessible for me. So I went home and uh, took this spectrum. Stuck my DSLR, put on a little camera tracker, put the little star analyzer on it, and shot a star called EZ Canis Majoris. And I was not, I was not pleased. <laughs> After nearly 20 minutes of track exposures, I had noise, basically. There was one emission line that showed up, and that was kind of cool. You know, I can see that there's helium emission in that star, but that's pretty well known to say the least. And this star was only about seventh magnitude. And so I thought, well, if I can't even get a good spectrum of a seventh magnitude star with 20 minutes of exposure time, that's no good. And I was not satisfied with my results, but I kept trying and trying some more and trying some more. And after about a year of optimization, I took a trip out to the dark site with my daub, the one that need not apply <laughs> because it doesn't have tracking. And I took this spectrum of EZ Canis Majoris. And it took under a minute this time because it turns out that even though, yes, tracking is important for spectrography, what you're really caring about is the amount of light. And when you compare the one inch aperture of a planetary filter on the front of a DSLR, to a 12 inch aperture Dobsonian, the 12 inch will win out, even if you can't go long exposure. And uh, one, one more thing I should mention is that there was also an upgrade of camera in between the two spectra. The first one was taken with a color camera and the second one was taken with a monochrome camera. And that helps because uh, over here on the left side, we've got some ultraviolet stuff and on the right, we've got some infrared stuff. Both of those usually get cut off by the filters and color cameras. So that spectrum uh, would be looking a bit truncated if I took it with the color camera on the dog. Okay, <clears throat> so much optimization later. This is what my rig looks like. My spectroscopy rig. Set it up in the backyard and you know what? It might not have a paramount or a rotator on it, but it takes some darn good spectra. All I need is a dog camera, finder scope, a laptop, and the cords to connect them all. Let's take a closer look at the camera assembly. So here's what I use. The specific, the specific configuration doesn't matter all that much, just the general. So you have a camera. You can, this one is a cool camera because I'm, I'm lucky enough to have one of those now. Um, however, you can use an uncooled camera. You can use a webcam. You can probably use a DSLR. I haven't, I have not yet tried a DSLR with my Dobbs because I don't have one that has live view, um, but you can probably use one. Uh, 
right here, all this stuff in the middle is spacers. Right here, it says two times Barlow lens. Don't be fooled. I have taken the lens out of this Barlow. It's just the tube now. I'm using it to help get some extra spacing and also to get some uh, finer control when I'm aligning the optics on the end. So down here on the end, I've got a star analyzer, which is that diffraction grading in a filter cell. I've got a 3.8 degree prism, which I, I will talk more about later, but it's basically a corrective optic that sharpens the star analyzer a little bit. So you've got the spectral optics down here, just a bunch of spacers here and the camera. That's all you need really, I mean, plus the dog. And so here's what it looks like when I set up that rig and I go ahead, there we go. Go ahead and point it at a star. So this is using my monochrome camera. Uh, you can imagine the spectrum is a streak of rainbow color if you want. <laughs> um, star on the left, spectrum on the right. It drifts across the field of view pretty rapidly, as you can see, because no tracking, Galzonian, right? So if you wanted to record that spectrum, there's a few different methods you could use. You could take a single snapshot, like one of these video frames, and then you would have a noisy spectrum because you've only got like half a second worth of exposure and that doesn't really work. So let's toss that out the gate. Um, there's another method you could use, which is to take a long exposure. Let's pretend that this whole time that that's been drifting across the field of view, I've been shooting a long exposure. The spectrum will probably come out looking something like this. So that is the traditional way to do spectrography with a non-tracking telescope. And you can get some good results that way. But there's one issue. What if you have a target like this wolf ray at star, I think it's wolf ray at uh, 137, which is, hold on, let me get the pointer back. Can you see my pointer? We can see the mouse pointer, yeah. Okay, good. It's this one right here. It's got the bright dots in the spectrum. Those are emission lines. That's what I wanted to document. It's sandwiched between two brighter spectra. So if I try and take a long exposure of that one, it's gonna look like that. And I, I can't extract anything usable out of that. It's so faint that any background stars show up brighter than the emission lines I'm trying to document. And it's trailed over by other spectra. So, the solution to that, the one that I ultimately came up with, is drift scanning method, is what I call it. And it relies on short exposure stacking, which is not a new concept, not at all, but it's very effective when applied to non track spectrography, as it turns out. So I'm going to take you through the steps of the drift scanning method. First of all, you need to rotate the grading. Once you have the, everything like the equipment set up. I'm not, I'm not covering that. You have to, you know, carry your telescope out, set it in the field, stick the camera <laughs> and focus there. And then it's time to rotate the grading because when you start out, the spectrum might be way off at a crazy angle. So you rotate the grading so that the spectrum goes horizontal because it is a directional device. It doesn't, it doesn't just magically know which way is right on the camera sensor and then project the, the spectrum that way. And I'm gonna play that video again. The way I'm doing that is by rotating the Barlow housing. And I found that I get a lot finer control over the ultimate degree of rotation than if I try just rotating the thing on the end. So that's why I use that Barlow housing. It puts a little bit of friction. All right, and once your spectrum is horizontal, then the next step is to rotate the camera. I'm trying to get everything in rotational alignment here. The camera is not rotated correctly. Your star will not drift straight down, which is going to limit the amount of time you can shoot it. So you rotate the camera and you do that by the angle that the star was drifting. So in this case, if it was drifting uh, down to the right by 45 degrees, you would rotate the camera by that amount. I'm gonna play that again so that you can see it again. So it's drifting down at an angle. I see that angle. And then 
I imagine that angle on the back of the camera is what I normally do. I look at a reference point like the ZWO printing there, right? And then I move it by the to the uh, angle that the star was drifting. There you go. And now the star drifts straight down. All right. So after the um, grading is in rotational alignment, so that the spectrum is on the right, and the camera is in rotational alignment, so that it's drifting straight down, then it's time to focus the spectrum. Notice that I said focus the spectrum, not focus the star. It's a very inconvenient fact in spectrography that the spectrum is produced at a different focal plane from the star. If you focus on the star, you're going to get a lumpy potato spectrum. It's not, it's not going to look good. So you have to focus on the spectrum. Now, depending on the resolution that you're at, you'll want to use different types of features to focus. Hydrogen Balmer lines in an early A-type star are typically recommended for focusing. Uh, don't be fooled. If you're working at a higher resolution, hydrogen Balmer lines are a very bad choice for focusing because it turns out that they are naturally blurry in a lot of stars, like A stars, because of the pressure at the surface is broadening them. So um, that, that really confused me for a while. I spent several months thinking I couldn't get a good focus because I was trying to focus on something that is naturally blurry. Um, it's like if you have, I don't know, a little bright planetary nebula in your field and you pick that as your star to focus on, that would be disappointing. So when you're at low resolution, then the, the spectral lines aren't resolved. Go ahead and use the Balmer lines to focus because they're the most obvious thing. Once you go to higher resolution, a little trick you can use is that over in the infrared are these telluric molecular bands is what they're called. Um, they are coming from Earth's atmosphere because uh, unfortunately for us, <laughs> the light has to pass through the atmosphere on its way to us. And uh, water and oxygen both have pretty prominent bands um, in the infrared that will take light out of the spectrum. Good news is that they don't exist in the extreme conditions of a star and they are not pressure broadened. So uh, they're gonna be very narrow, sharp lines that you can always count on to be perfectly sharp for focusing. And at any resolution, you can use a narrow emission line source. This bottom one here I've got is um, P Cygni, which is a really cool star. I'm gonna show some more spectra of that later. You need to know that the star that you're shooting does in fact have a narrow line because some of them are broadened, some of them are not. Um, but they do make good focusing targets because then it's a lot more like focusing a star. It's obvious when you reach best focus. Okay, let's see what's next. Um, yes, that's right. So after you are in focus, you need to go ahead and position the spectrum. Uh, basically, the farther towards the top that you put the spectrum before you start recording, the longer it will stay in the field of view and the more exposure time you can get. Farther towards the left, the more of the spectrum will fit on the field of view. Once you start recording, uh, just let it go. This is fast forwarded. And then as it gets towards the end, make sure that you stop it before the spectrum runs off the field of view because it, it's just a lot easier when you're processing to not have to go in and, and remove empty frames. Okay, and the final step, step is in software. You have the video of a spectrum drifting across your field of view, all nice and in focus and not going off at an angle because you rotated the camera right. So now it's time to align and stack. Alignment is done using the star. This is why you don't just zoom in all the way on the spectrum. You make sure that you're zoomed out enough that you've got the star in there, and except for in a few special instances. Um, there's a program called Serial. That's S-I-R-I-L. Great free program. If you go open Serial, go to the Sequence tab, and then load the folder that has your spectral images in it. As long as you recorded in a um, common video format called .sir, it will automatically detect and load your, your files. You don't have to convert them or anything. Um, and then if you, it, in the preview window that opens up, you just select the star. So you're telling Serial, here's the star in frame number one. You go to the registration tab, 
make sure it's on one star registration mode, tell it to follow the star, and then tell it to register. And what it's doing is it's stepping through each frame, searching the box for something that looks like a star, and then recentering the box on wherever it found the star so that it'll, it'll track it as it goes down. Um, so if you ever find you're, that you're having issues with it not detecting the star, you can try a bigger box uh, so it'll not lose it in between frames. And then once it's registered, you can stack, set your stacking settings in there. If you want to use rejection, you can. Um, and it'll use the aligned frames, stack them together to improve the signal to noise ratio. Just takes a second. Right. And there we go. And then in the preview window, we'll pop up the stacked image. And you can stretch it with the bars on the bottom to make it look brighter. And this image can now be loaded into uh, any software. The reason I overexposed it just then, by the way, was to check for stacking artifacts. If, if the registration goes bad, which once you figure out some good settings, it's, it's very rare for that to happen. But if it goes bad, you'll notice ghost images of the spectrum in places where it shouldn't be if you, if you overexpose the image. Um, but this image can now be loaded into any uh, spectral analysis software. It's a fully produced spectral image. So you can put it into a software like RSpec or um, ISIS, uh, Visual Spec, yeah. And uh, that will turn it into a graph. And there's, there's tutorials out there for that. All right, so there you go. That's the drift scanning method. That's how you acquire and then reduce a spectrum without having tracking. So let's go over some of the pros of the drift scanning method, aka why I like it so much. It is low cost. It is inexpensive. You don't need a tracking mount. That's my favorite part. <laughs> you don't need a tracking mount. Yay, I don't need a tracking mount. It is simple. And it really, it really is. It's easy. It is manual labor intensive, though, because if you want more exposure than about one minute or so, well, the star is going to go out of the field of view. So you have to manually grab your telescope and reposition it so that the star is back in the field of view. Rinse and repeat for as long as you want exposure time. I have spent, I have spent a very long time doing that now that I know this method. Um, in fact, last summer I wound up spending. I, I pulled eight all-nighters in a row because I saw a good span of forecasts coming. And uh, the only thing that saved me, honestly, was audiobooks. If you put on an audiobook while you're busy, you know, repositioning the telescope every minute and a half, um, then that, that greatly wears away at the tedium. All right. Uh, fast setup and teardown. I really like this, too, because uh, especially if you're doing it from in the city, which, by the way, it works really well in the city. All of the spectra I'm showing you have been taken in the city with the exception of the easy Canis Majoris at the beginning, but honestly, that could have been done just as well in the city. Um, if you are in the city, then you probably have noticed the mosquito sprayer trucks coming through uh, in the summer. And they have been a bit of a nuisance to me. If I were out there with uh, some sort of fancy rig on a fancy mount that I had, I. I don't know, weighs 100 pounds, I would be in a much tougher position when I hear the truck start driving down the street, spraying whatever is in the, in the spray. Um, as it is, I can just go ahead and grab my telescope in one hand, laptop in the other, and sprint inside. And I have, in fact, done that too many times. And it's, it's a good workout, I'll tell you. Um, the magnitude limit is about nine with my eight inch in the city, which for spectrography is actually quite good, all things considered. Um, they say the spectrographic limiting magnitude is usually five or six magnitudes worse than your normal limiting magnitude with the telescope uh, without a diffraction rating in there. Because you're taking starlight, it's supposed to be all concentrated into a tiny little point, and you're spreading it out into a spectrum. And the, the, the efficiency as you're doing so isn't 100% perfect either. And the final pro, is actually not drift scanning specific, but I want to highlight this 
that it is possible to get high spectral resolutions, much higher than what's typically assumed possible with a star analyzer. You could do this on a tracking telescope too. There's nothing about an untracked telescope that says star analyzers are suddenly high resolution. But I want to draw attention to the fact that these little, these little gratings that come in the little filter housings are quite powerful. They normally say, like on the sales pages and stuff, they'll say that uh, you can expect a resolution of R equals 150. Personally, I've been able to get resolutions of over R1500, which 10 times improvement, I feel like that should be out there somewhere. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how exactly do you get high resolution. Once you have all this kit and you know how to record a spectrum, how do you get high, higher resolution? Well, first step is the prism. That 3.8 degree prism that you saw I had behind my star analyzer on the camera assembly. So normally, normally when you take a spectrum, the light from the star shines straight through and the, and the spectrum is produced off to the side, like you saw in the images, right? That's an issue because if your camera sensor is centered behind the grating, then you're going to have to move it until the star is off axis for the spectrum to wind up on the sensor, right? So what the prism does is it lets you keep the star on axis and then redirects the spectrum, which is sharper due to being on axis, back onto the sensor, into the middle of the sensor. So you actually wind up with a pretty significant improvement in resolution from that. And that is, that is one of the single best things you can do for your resolution. However, once you have one of these prisms, you're going to need to take advantage of the buff in resolution by doing this. Spacers, spacers out the wazoo. This is, I, I, I have shot some of my best spectra with this configuration. Yes, it's ridiculous. I, I would have put more spacers if it weren't for the fact that I would have then hit my secondary mirror. So what you're doing when you add spacing between the grating and the camera is, if you go back to the previous slide, you're giving the spectrum time to spread out. So the, the more spacing you have, the bigger the spectrum is getting. That spacing is basically controlling the magnification of the spectrum. So once you have a prism and you've got a sharp spectrum, you might as well magnify the heck out of it and get a lot of resolution. There's another benefit that comes from these spacing spacers. Well, it's kind of double-edged um, because you can have uh, a lot of magnification piled on there to the point where your incoming light cone is uh, vignetted because you have a one inch opening, but you're sticking it down to a point where the incoming light cone is larger in diameter than one inch. So some of that light's coming in and just hitting the, the outside of the spacers and ending there. So you wind up having an effectively smaller aperture, which is bad for your limiting magnitude, but at the same time, good for resolution because you're, when, when you really push the spacing, like when you're going after bright targets, you're getting kind of an automatic um, uh, longer focal ratio. And spectrography, unfortunately, is unusually sensitive to focal ratio. Most, most people are working at like a focal ratio of F10 when they do spectra, just because um, there's an aberration called spectral coma, which behaves similar to coma that gets so severe at these, at uh, even, even a focal ratio of F5 um, is pretty severe. So uh, the vignetting that you get with a ridiculous amount of spaces like this can be sort of a bonus uh, because it will cut down on the spectral coma, it, it, but you know, less limiting magnitude. So when you want limiting magnitude, you take the spaces out. Uh, it's, it's a matter of optimization. All right, so here I have a chart. I shot p -Signy. A, like a dozen times in a row, changing the equipment between each time to get an idea of what are the effects of spacing and the prism. So on the left, we have spectra taken without the prism. On the right, spectra taken with the prism. And then the spacing increases as you go down. Now, 
if you notice, the very bottom left spectrum, the one without a prism, is actually the best one. And that's because the prism sharpen, it sharpens the image dramatically, as you can see on the top row, but it introduces its own minute amount of bending to the spectral line. So if you are using it without a prism and you, you pump the spacing up to the point where the vignetting is already cutting out basically all of the spectral coma, there's nothing left for the prism to remove. All you get is the slight bit of curve from the downside of adding the prism. So you're better off without it. But that only happens at extreme levels of spacing. Um, so yeah, there's, a, there's an example of what happens with which. OK, now let's see what's next. Oh, yes. Um, so one thing to be aware of when you are recording your spectra, always it's a good idea to be aware of any aberrations that might be inherent in your system. Because if you're going to be using your data for science, you need to be able to tell the difference between, is this in my telescope or is this in the star? This is an example of something that's in the telescope. So in this case, I took a long exposure of Vega as it trailed across the field of view. So this is not drift scan, this is just a long exposure. And I'm this animation is panning from the top of the image to the bottom of the image, back, up, down, up, down. And hopefully you can see some kind of uh, ripples in it that are moving side to side. Right, so those are coming from thin film interference in the sensor substrate. They are not part of the star, they are part of the sensor, the broad, smooth ripples. The thin lines, those are parts of the star or our atmosphere, um, either, either one of those. They're real. The ripples are real in a sense, but they're not being produced as part of the spectrum literally until it strikes your sensor. It's, it's an instrumental effect. So it's always good to be aware that those exist. All right. Now, <clears throat> some examples. This is the best part of the talk I get to show off. All right. So here are some spectra I took of Vega on the top and Deneb on the bottom. Now, Vega is a main sequence star and Deneb is a giant. So uh, the pressure on Deneb is a lot lower than it is on Vega. And so you, you get this, um, this broadening to the spectral line on Vega, like I was talking about. See how the, the Balmer lines, these, these spectra were taking the same resolution. You can confirm that by looking over here on the right at the lines from Earth's atmosphere. They're not blurred, right? But the lines in Vega are inherently blurred due to the conditions of the star. Whereas on Deneb, it's kind of a more interesting spectrum in my opinion because the lines are not blurred and you can see a lot of fine little metal lines appear. So these, uh, these evenly spaced ones are hydrogen lines. Hydrogen does this nice even series for us. It's pretty much the only element that does that, uh, I guess, because it's so simple. The rest of them are pretty chaotic. So you're seeing in Deneb, there's some Helium lines, um, I think the sodium doublet is present, which is this dude here. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure what the rest are, but there, there do exist spectral atlases and guides that you can use to cross-reference your spectra and find out the exact identification of each line. One of those uh, good guides is called uh, Walker's Spectral Atlas for Amateur Astronomers. So uh, I, can, I can put that in the chat at the end or something like that, but there's a, a free PDF version of an earlier edition that is uh, available online. All right, so here's another example of high resolution. Now this one was taken proper drift scanning, not just a long exposure. And um, to get a higher resolution than usual, I did something a little bit interesting. Um, I magnified the spectrum to the point where the star was not visible. So normally registration from that point would not be possible without special software because all of our astronomical software is built to register images by looking at stars. But this emission line here, this hydrogen emission line here is so bright in T Cygni, it looks like a star to the software. So I was able to magnify the spectrum until it filled the field of view and then tell the software that this line down here was a star and it registered and stacked just fine for me. So I'm glad that it did that. Um, if you look quite closely, there are a few different 
lines in here. Mainly it's this one, this emission line here, and this one here. This one here is actually stronger. Where you have an emission line on the right side, but then just to the left of it, there's an absorption line. So the graph goes down, the spectrum gets darker. And that's something that's actually there in P-Signy. It's a real effect. It's called the P-Signy profile. It's named after the star. And it's actually evidence of blue shift. So normally when we think of blue shift and red shift as amateur astronomers, or at least me, I usually think of stuff that's far away, like galaxies and quasars, they're red shifted, right? Andromeda galaxy is blue shifted, it's coming towards us. But stars and well, anything really can show blue shift and red shift if you go to a high enough resolution when you're looking in the spectrum. So that's like the radial velocities of stars. That's a measurement of red shift, blue shift, right? Um, in this case, we have a star, P. Cygni. It's a young star, or at least a very hot one, actually. I guess I don't know if it's super young. It's called a luminous blue variable. It's losing mass at a tremendous rate, a scary rate. That's what all of the emission in here is. That's from the corona of the star. Normally, like on the sun, you don't, you don't see that. The sun is not, the corona is not massive enough for this, but this star is losing significant fractions of its mass in the form of a stellar wind that I, I wouldn't want to be on a planet around that star, let's just say that. Um, and you see it as sort of like a halo. If you can imagine being close enough to the star where you could actually see the disk. So you have the corona around it, right? And so that is on average at rest wavelength because sure, some parts are coming a little bit of an angle towards you, so they'd be blue shifted a little bit. Some parts are going away, so they'd be redshifted a little bit. But on average, it's the natural wavelength of the line. But if you think about how some of the coronal wind must be flowing straight at you, that's blue shifted. And since it's flowing straight at you, it's viewed against the backdrop of the very bright disk of the star. That kind of condition, bright light source behind a gas, is what produces an absorption line. So you get blue shifted copies of the absorption lines right next to the emission lines. Now, unfortunately, um, I didn't, I don't have a, I didn't have a fancy slide prepared, but I, I do actually have a higher resolution spectrum that shows it better. I really should have, um, I really should put that together. <laughs> but um, over here is one that, that for sure, yeah, compared to this high resolution spectra. And that, that little dip there is actually showing a uh, blue shift. So I think it's very cool, even though it doesn't look like much out, out of context, I think it's very cool that you can measure blue shift in a star's stellar wind just using a little diffraction grating and a daub in your backyard in the city. Like, that's so cool. <laughs> okay, uh, next example. So this one is much more recent. I just took this last week. Um, Zeta Tauri is a very cool star. It's a BE star. It's very hot, uh, just like P. Cygni. So like on P. Cygni, um, you can see how it, it slopes up generally to the left. It's getting brighter the bluer we go. In fact, it keeps getting brighter even into the UV uh, because it's, it's so hot. It has gone past blue hot. It is now UV hot is how you can think of it. Same thing with Zeta Tau. Um, however, Zeta Tau does not have the truly terrifying stellar wind, so you don't see all of those huge emission lines. Mostly you see absorption lines. But over here, you can see an emission line. That one is coming from a disk around the star. Let's go ahead and zoom in on that one. There we go. So there's a disk around the star, and it's rotating. This is one of the open questions in astronomy is why is there a disk? Where does it come from? They don't know. Professional astronomers don't know yet. This is an area of active study. But we can tell that there's a disk because we see the emission from it. It's a disk of gas being excited by the light from the star and spinning. As it spins, that effectively broadens the line because one side of the disk is coming at you, it's blue shifted. The other side, it's going away, it's red shifted. 
And then of course there's some emission in the middle, right? Um, so in this case, the geometry of the disk is such that there's also some absorption. Uh, it's honestly, I don't know whether it's self-absorption as in the material in the disk is thick enough that some of the emission from the disk as it's working its way out um, gets reabsorbed. That's, that's sometimes the thing that happens. There's also um, like P-signy when you have uh, light that's coming straight at you, only in this case, the light from the star would be encountering uh, matter that's moving straight sideways, not towards you or at you. So the emission would be centered on the line instead of blue shifted. That's also a possibility. I think both of those happen in BE stars and I haven't uh, yet found out which one Zeta Tauri is. However, uh, I do know that it's, it's very cool that you can detect this kind of thing that's still an open question. Professional astronomers are mystified and actively working on it and you can just go outside in your backyard and take a measurement yourself. And in fact, professional astronomers don't have enough telescopes to monitor the BE stars that they want to. And I think they may not even want to when they have the telescope time because BE stars are very bright. This one's Zeta Tauri, it's easy to see with the naked eye. It's one of the horns of Taurus. Um, four of the stars, four of the seven main stars in the Pleiades are BE stars. Like these, these things are common. They're all over the sky. They're bright and they don't, professional astronomers don't know what they are yet. And so they have solicited the help of amateur astronomers like me. And there's a group in uh, France who's very dedicated spectrographers doing some really impressive stuff. They've set up a database. I will, I will show you the database in a minute, but um, they allow people to submit spectra that were, have been taken of these stars and then the professional astronomers use that database. They go there and they pull their observations from that whenever they start a new study on BE stars. So that's one way that amateurs can contribute very actively and easily. Here's another spectrum. Uh, <clears throat> this one is from a fairly cool star, Arcturus. And I just wanted to show this one because it's got some uh, Fraunhofer lines. That's what these are called that have the letter names, right? So, um, you may be familiar with Fraunhofer lines because they're the most prominent lines in the sun spectrum. So if you've ever used a spectroscope visually, then you're probably going, oh, hey, look, yeah, there's a sodium doublet and the magnesium triplet. So um, yeah, those are, this Arcturus spectrum actually looks quite similar to the sun, even though it's, it's a fairly different star. Um, it's close enough in temperature that most of the uh, difference is of the kind that you notice when you're looking at the graph and not at the uh, at the actual photograph of the spectrum, which, uh, by the way, this is colorized. I took it with a monochrome camera and then I applied a visual simulation to it. So you could see this is what it would look like if you were actually uh, looking at it through the spectrograph visually. Okay, and lastly, because I've just shown three fairly bright stars, this one is a fairly faint one, at least for spectrographic terms. RT Virginis, it was around magnitude nine, I think, or maybe eight or nine when I shot it. Um, now, the Johnson V magnitude is measured down here on the end where it's noisy uh, because it, it, they don't measure the IR when they're taking that into account. But I find it to be a very cool star anyhow, because it is, it's a very cold star. It's got a lot of those molecular bands like I was pointing out in the, the first slide. <clears throat> and that's what causes this stair stepping. And the star just takes off. And you, you may have heard the term ultraviolet catastrophe. I, I think of this one as an infrared catastrophe because man, if, if there were aliens living on a planet around this star, I bet you they'd be seeing an infrared. <laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't bother with visual or their parent star is hardly putting out any flux. You were to take an infrared image of the sky, this thing is a headlamp. Okay, let's see what's next. Oh yes, okay, so the databases. This is how you can make a contribution. AVSO has a database. And let me tell you something about this one and the BE star database that I'm about to show you. <clears throat> Professional astronomers do use them and the people who are accepting the contributions 
I, I actually know them. Like I've met them and had conversations with them and stuff. They will help you. If you, if you submit a spectrum and you're not sure about its quality or whatever, they will give you actual like actionable feedback. They will help mentor you until you're at the point where you can take like super awesome spectra that the professionals will love to use. Um, they are, they're more than happy to do that. So it's not like you have to go become some sort of super expert in the topic before you can start contributing. You can just begin. And if there's something wrong with your spectra, the database administrators will reach out and they'll say, hey, have you tried calibrating it in this way? So uh, this is the AAVSO one. It's called AV spec. And then there is the BESS database, BE stars something. <laughs> um, and you can register as an observer. This one is a, a little stricter than the AAVSO database in terms of uh, both the quality of submissions and also what kind of submissions because they will only take BE stars. Um, but also they're working on one of the larger open questions in astronomy. So you have, a very good chance that your spectra will actually get used by a professional astronomer in their in their research if you submit to BESS. All right, so now I'd like to close with a quote that I just love from the user Lazarus on Cloudy Nights. He said, it's amazing how much good stuff is available nowadays and how cheap some of it is. Things were much different when I was a newbie back in the paleoastronomical epoch and we had to make our own telescopes out of sticks and shiny rocks. And the only constellations were the very big cave bear and Ortho the hunter gatherer because nobody had made up the rest of them. Now, I was not alive in this paleoastronomical epoch that he mentions, but I'll tell you what, I've read about what spectrography was like even just 20 years ago. And it's like, wow, we have come such a long way because it is easy now. There is good stuff available and it is cheap. All you need is the little grading and a camera, a CMOS camera, which are getting very inexpensive for very high quality nowadays and a Dobsonian, which I, I venture that if you're watching or actually it doesn't have to be a Dobsonian, it can be any telescope. Um, I'm, I just say Dobsonian because that's what I have, but it can be literally any telescope as long as it accepts a camera and it, you can take spectra. You can take valuable spectra that actual scientists will use. And I think that is just astounding. So uh, if you are interested in learning more, I do have a page on my website um, that's a step-by-step -step guide so that you don't have to remember this. Although I think that this presentation will be recorded and available on the HAS site. So yay for that. But um, you have also have that reference on my website, which is tiedyeastronomer.com. It's also the latter part of my email address, lauren at tiedyeastronomer.com. And I implore you, if you find yourself interested in spectrography and you want a mentor, reach out to me. That's kind of what I do. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Lauren. That was a, an awesome presentation. And like I said, um, from the first time I met you at one of our outreach events to now, it's just amazing to see uh, just how much more involved you've become in um, just all aspects of astronomy and especially here with the uh, spectrography. So uh, glad to have you in the club and uh, just a wonderful asset and resource for those of us who want to learn this. Uh, we did have a number of questions that uh, came up. So uh, right. if you're ready for those, we can we can jump into those. Uh, Celsa was the first one to ask a question. Celsa, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, um, I was, my question was in regards to the equipment. I, I do have a Dobsonian eight inches and I'm planning on buying a Star Analyzer 100 like what she has and a, a ZWO ASI 178 millimeters monochrome. But now you mentioned the spacer, so and I can tell I may need a little bit more for adapting the cameras, but would you say this is a good combination? Absolutely. That is actually exactly the combination that I started doing drift scanning with. Um, my eight inch Dobsonian and I had a uh, ASI 178 mm. So um, the spacers are optional. They are used to improve your resolution. So the base resolution, as I recall from having my star analyzer on the um, uh, ASI, 178 was it was good for 
general spectral typing of stars. Like it was enough to look at a star and say, oh yes, this is an M type star or oh yes, this is an A type star. But it wasn't to the point quite of uh, resolving the, these individual fine lines. So um, if you want to reach that, it can be anything. If you have, most of my, most of my spacers are like homemade. Um, if you have uh, like an old Barlow lying around or actually it doesn't even have to be old. It doesn't destroy the Barlow to take the lens off. It just unscrews. Um, so you can, you can use a, a Barlow as a spacer. You can use, uh, if you have planetary filters or something like that, that you don't care about, you can take the filter glass out. That technically doesn't destroy it, but it could be a pain to assemble it again. So I would only do that if you're not wanting to actively use the planetary filters anymore. Um, I can go back. Thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to contact you and uh, I will ask you to be my mentor. <laughs> Great. Sounds you good. will hear from me later. Thank you so much. This is amazing. So I'll just, what I'll do, I'll just follow you up in your website and I'll contact you for. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Larry. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, thanks for the questions, Elsa. Uh, Jeff was next on the list. Jeff, do you wanna come off mute and ask your question? And if not, then I'll go ahead and ask on his behalf. Uh, he had asked, does the 3.8 prism cause any degradation or attenuation of the signal? Yes, it does. Uh, let me go back um, to that slide. Oh, I should name these slides. Uh, <laughs> here. here we go. OK, so <clears throat> um, down here on the bottom right, you can see how the 3.8 prism, the, the spectrum taken with 3.8 prism is actually a bit worse than the one on the left. Um, it's the 3.8 prism is a trade-off. It removes a lot of spectral coma, but it adds some internal reflection smile type aberration. Um, it, the name doesn't matter that much. It's just, it's, it adds a little bit of distortion at the cost of removing a lot of spectral coma. So if you, you naturally have a very low amount of spectral coma, like in the instance where you're using very high amounts of spacing, so you're vignetting the spectral coma away, then it's actually better to use it without a prism. But if you're using it in a low amount of spacing, you can see like comparing this row, it is a lot better to have the prism because even though it adds a little bit of distortion, you're removing a lot of blur. Excellent. Thanks for that answer. And then uh, somewhat related, Jason Salinas had asked a question. Uh, Jason, you want to come off mute and ask your question to Lauren? Yeah, sure. Um, Lauren, I have awesome presentation. Me and my wife really appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to get a little more information about what spectral coma was. You mentioned this a few different times. That's, uh, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, so, okay, if you look here, uh, at this bright spectral line, you can kind of see how there's like a fan of blur coming out of it pointing towards the right. That's what spectral coma looks like. Um, it comes about kind of like normal coma. Are you familiar with coma in like a, a fast Newtonian reflector? Okay, so it's, it's an optical aberration where the light isn't quite focused down to a perfect point. The faster the telescope, as in the shorter the focal ratio, uh, the more of the light winds up going into this kind of fan shaped, they call it coma because it looks like a comet. Um, and so spectral coma is, is similar to that and it behaves similarly in that it gets worse the faster the focal ratio of the light, but it comes from when the light passes through the diffraction grating. So uh, that's why if, if you build like a dedicated spectrograph or something like that, not just a single diffraction grating. They have special lenses that are used to make the light actually be collimated when it passes through the grating and then start focusing again. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but basically it's an optical aberration that causes blur and looks like regular telescope coma. Is there, did you have anything else to add to the question or did that answer it? No, it was good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the question, Jason. Our good friend Justin McCollum had a question as well. Justin, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yes. I was curious about the spacers you use. Are they just prism spacers or did you remove the material and just use them as open caps? And how would that differ in terms of 
in terms of magnification, in terms of focal ratio, if you just used ex additional extension tubes for the quality of your spectra? So for the spacers, it doesn't matter what they're made out of, just as long as they don't have optics in them. So in this case, like the reason it looks weirdly complex is just because I, I scavenged whatever I had around the house. So these were spacers that came with my, um, my camera here. This one here is the remains of an old Barlow. I took the lens out. Mm -hmm. um, and then here, these used to be planetary filters, but I took the filters out. So now it's just the mm -hmm. housings. And uh, the point of the spacers is to get the uh, grading optics here farther away from the camera sensor so that the spectrum will have more time to spread out and get magnified. Because it's naturally, after it hits the, the grating, it's naturally becoming magnified the longer it has to spread out. So that's that's what spacers are for, is just to give it more time. To are you looking just to spread out those spectral lines to see them up close to get more resolution and whether or not you see like a Zeeman effect if you see line splitting with the spectral lines? Um, the, the Zeeman effect is definitely something that is uh, too small to see with a star analyzer like ever. There's some un unfortunate laws of physics with regards to these kind of gratings that won't let you see the Zeeman effect. But yes, to the rest of that, it the spacers just allow higher resolution. And, so you just don't have enough uh, spacing. You just don't have enough uh, grading lines in the resolution for those uh, particular prisms. Uh, yes, that, that sounds correct. The, the Zeeman effect would not, be, would not be visible with one of these because the inherent resolution of the grading is not high enough. Mm -hmm. But you can push the resolution to something that's close to maybe half of the theoretical resolution of one of these gratings just by adding enough spacers that the spectrum has enough time to get magnified. Okay, okay. thanks, Justin. Uh, Michael LeBlanc, you had asked a question uh, as well, and I think we might've gotten to it at the end of it, but go ahead and ask your question here. Well, th oh, thank you. And this was a really interesting presentation. Uh, at the time when I, um, asked the question, I typed it in, you had spent a lot of time uh, explaining how we can actually get the spectra. And I was curious to know like what you do with the spectra once you have them and you went, that was really the second half of your presentation, which was, which was really awesome. So because I mostly had the answer from, from your talk, I would like to ask you now, it seems like with this uh, hobby, it's great. You can spend time at night, right? And, and get the get the data and then you have actually recording of it. And then you can go and spend, have even more fun processing it, understanding what it means, right? And is that, um, where do you get the most satisfaction? Actually collecting the, the spectra or actually looking at them and then analyzing them and see what uh, meaning you get from them? That is, that is a good question. Um, I think for me, the collection is the most fun, but a close second is when I put together the, the fancy graphics like um, these. I really enjoy just being able to see, especially the ones that are colorized. I'm like, man, that's so cool. But um, the most fun is when I see something like this one, this Zeta Tauri spectrum, uh, seeing it live on the screen, twinkling a little bit as the atmosphere is, is uh, twinkling the star. That's just amazing. And, and you know you're gonna be you're gonna be able to process it even further, you know, once you you see it live and then and then you know that once I'm you like, process so it. Oh, it must it must be even better than this. And I'm already seeing that little uh, yeah. absorption line there. So yeah, it, it's really exciting. Great, thank you. And yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, Cole Harris. Cole, do you wanna come off mute and ask your question? And if Cole doesn't come off, I'll ask on his behalf. All right, so Cole had asked, how do you calibrate the spectra? Calibrate, okay, so uh, there's a couple of different calibrations that occur. The one that spectrographers actually call calibration, because we do, it's, it's a little confusing in what we name everything. The one actually called calibration is the one where we um, align the spectrum to figure out uh, what, what the different wavelength values are. Let's see, this one will be clearer for everyone to see, yeah. So putting it on this scale here, that's what we call calibration. And to do that, we look at, at least at the star level of resolution of the star analyzer, you look at the uh, known wavelengths for certain spectral lines that you can recognize. Like this group here, the magnesium triplet, 
very recognizable. Same thing with sodium doublet. They're in, in certain types of stars, they're the strongest features in the spectrum, pretty much. So we know, uh, thanks to measuring their wavelengths here on Earth, we know the wavelengths of those very precisely. So in the I use a software called RSpec, but there's a lot of other software out there, including freeware, that will do it. Um, you load your spectrum, you click on a part of the spectrum, you type in what wavelength you know from consulting your, your reference charts, you type in what wavelength you know it is, and then it puts it on this calibrated scale. Uh, the other calibration is removing the instrumental effects from the camera, and you do that by looking at the way the spectrum bends, you extract this rough curve, and you divide it by a reference curve. And that gives you uh, that that removes the effects of the the uh, instrumental response. So I think that that's two main kinds of calibration that you would you care about. <laughs> Thanks for that, Lauren. And uh, you bring up a good point. So to follow up on your presentation, we we did have Tom Field, who is the author of the RSpec software uh, that spoke with the Houston Astronomical Society several months back. So you can always go back and, and take a look at that presentation after reviewing Lauren's and kind of see how both of these uh, presentations come together to bring us uh, these types of graphs and images. So thank you. And then uh, Bill Spaziri was last and he had two questions and two comments. So <laughs> go ahead and take your sip of water and get ready for those. Bill, do you want to come off mute and ask? Uh, oh, hi. Yeah, uh, two Two comments, two questions. Um, uh, it, it's very obvious that you know, the passion you have for this topic and the hard work you've done in this area has resulted in a terrific capability that you have. And I find that really exciting and encouraging. And I, I just congratulate you for that. It's obvious that you do you've done a lot of work and you've got a great capability. My other comment is I just figured out while I was thinking about this that I've been involved in listening to and giving presentations for about 45 years and you do a fantastic job. Your presentation uh, was put together and presented terrifically in my opinion among the best I've seen without a doubt. So I congratulate you on that. Thank you. More uh, importantly, how the heck did you scam a Sloan disk? Okay. And you only have to tell us <laughs> if it's legal. Okay. Um, okay. So I, uh, I went to the Sloan Digital uh, Sky Survey Observatory up there on Apache Point. Um, and I, that was actually immediately after uh, SMSW2. Um, you remember I, I showed that at the very beginning that I went to that conference. So uh, there was a group of people who got together at the end and they went out to the uh, VLA. And I was like, man, I, I have to go see the SDSS while I'm there. Even, even though they're not, they don't do like, you know, public walkthroughs or anything. I was like, I just have to see the site. I love this place too much. And um, it was looking like it might be clear that night that we were in Alamogordo and I was like, oh gosh, I wonder if I can observe from up there. And so I wrote the, uh, it, it took some doing to find an email contact for someone up there, but I wrote them and I said, hey, can I observe up there? And um, they said, yeah, sure you can. Um, and do you want a tour while you're up there? And I was like, yes, 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 thank you, yes, please. <laughs> and they gave me a tour. Uh, I got to go in and see the telescope and use the paddle and spin it around and um, go into the, the plug plate fiber lab. And um, at, at, the, at the end of the tour, uh, the person who'd been showing me around very kindly gave me a plate. And I was just like, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I understand completely. Congratulations on that. Yeah, you're not gonna see a lot of those on eBay. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's that's a terrific story. Thank you. My last question is, how do you come up with what I think is the best zoom cursor ever? That little uh, com red comet that you got flying around? Oh, um, that's a part of um, Google Slides, which I'm using to present because I don't have PowerPoint. It, uh, when you go into Google Slides and um, move your cursor down here, it lets you click the pointer button and then it changes your, your cursor to the red comment thing. 
Very good. Thank you for letting me know. And again, I'll say you did a great job, great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. That means All right. And if you're okay with it, we had one more question kind of slip in at the end. Do you have time for that, Lauren? All right. Uh, Russell Hill had asked, uh, well, Russell, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Are y'all hearing me okay on this? We can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Lauren, I met you out there. This, in fact, uh, I'm in that picture, but it doesn't matter where. And I was so very impressed with your passion for spectroscopy. And gosh, you've learned a lot. I'm wondering if you're using the star analyzer with 100 or the 200 lines. Um, Thanks, Russell. And I think the quite just to repeat the question, because it was a little difficult to hear you there at the end. I believe the question was, are you using the uh, 100 line or 200 line star analyzer for your work right now? Yeah, that's correct. All right, thank you. First, hi, Russell. <laughs> it was great meeting you there. Um, and I'm using uh, the, the star analyzer 200 now. I, I got that very recently. Most of the spectra in here, hold on, let me flip to there. Most of the spectra were taken with the 100. Um, these, that's the 100, that's the 100, that's the one. No, that's the 200. So this is the one spectra spectrum in my talk that was taken with the star analyzer 200. And then all of the rest, uh, that one's 100. So is that one. So um, the star analyzer 200, I love it. It's a lot better uh, in my opinion because you don't have to use as many spacers to get the same amount of resolution. Um, but it's definitely possible to get high resolution with the Star Analyzer 100. Well, I think it's awesome what you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Lauren, thank you so much. And if I can share the screen here, if you don't mind. All right, are you seeing my, um, yes, my screen with your website on it? Yes. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to plug your website one more time, tiediastronomer.com. You can get a lot more information on what Lauren is doing uh, on her website there. And uh, as you mentioned, we do appreciate you offering to, to mentor those who uh, want to get more into this. And Lauren, uh, like I said, we couldn't be prouder of you and the progress that you made. Um, and we're um, really proud to call you one of our own. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing what you're doing here. Uh, with the rest of the folks here at HAS and uh, look forward to seeing you at the dark site sometime soon. So <laughs> I hope Thanks, that can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one last thing before we wrap up, I didn't mention it earlier, Stephen Jones wasn't on the call, but tomorrow night is our novice lab. So if you're a, a novice and wanting to get out to the dark site and you've taken your dark site orientation, uh, come join us. We're gonna have a good time at the dark site tomorrow. Weather looks to be decent. Uh, I don't think we're going to have clear skies throughout, but it's a, it's a wonderful time, especially if it's the first time to go out to the dark site uh, to visit there. Not, uh, and Stephen is going to go through his novice labs there. So uh, look forward to that. And uh, next month, our meeting is on April Fool's Day, Thursday, April 1st for our novice meeting. That'll be at 7 p.m. And uh, Debbie shared some of the information there. And then the next day on Friday, April 2nd, it will be our general meeting and uh, we look forward to meeting you all there. So if you're on social media, you can follow us on those links over on the left-hand side and YouTube on the right. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions and I, I changed the pointer to this uh, red laser just for Bill Spaziri, uh, <laughs> this is PowerPoint by the way, uh, you can email us at info at astronomyhouston.org and we would love to hear from you and answer any questions that you may have. So again, thank you, Lauren. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Hope you have a, a safe and happy weekend and uh, happy observing. Take care, everyone.